All right, I, we're going to go ahead and get started. It is 10.30, so welcome to a Webinar Wednesday, brought to you by the Family Community Wellness Program Area. I'm Marie Vitston, and um, I'm very pleased that Megan Dietrich is our presenter for today. Megan is a specialist and director of FNEP and Family Nutrition Program with NDSU Extension. The topic for today is Policy, Systems, and Environment, PSE, Change Outreach. What, why, and how. So thank you very much, Megan, for being here. I uh, will be recording the, the webinar and putting that out on our Ag Info Center after we're done. So I'll hand it over to Megan. Well, thank you, Marie. The first thing I would like everyone, I see a few of you have answered this question, but if you could go ahead and, and answer the question on the poll, how much do you know about policy systems and environmental change approaches, which we call PSCs? All right. So it looks like. Oh, here we go. So bear with me. I don't use Skype for business as as much as we use we use Zoom um, over in our area. But I I'm, I'm hoping that this will go smoothly. So it looks like it's I guess it's good that no one knows everything and could be presenting this web webinar. Otherwise, I'd probably say go for it. Um, you know, we some don't you know learning about the acronym. Um, others, you know, you've started to incorporate it. We have done some trainings on the FCW side, um, introducing some of the ideas and the concepts. Um, I really think transitioning to family and community wellness, that, that kind of speaks to um, looking at some of these, these broader outreach approaches too. So we're kind of slowly starting to move into that direction of, of integrating some of these new approaches with some of our, our more traditional programming. So help me know what slides I need to focus on and Know what slides I can breeze over, but the success of this is going to really depend on interaction from, from all of you as much as it is um, on my presentation. So I really hope that everyone feels open to either open up your mic and, and share something or to go ahead and use the chat box to either type in questions or, you know, respond to some of the things that we're going through. Now. All right, here we go. So I did keep the title slide in just because I think that, you know, extending knowledge, changing lives really does, especially that changing lives piece kind of does speak to, again, that, that broader, broader impact sometimes that we're looking for when we're considering incorporating some of these PSEs into our programming and outreach. Okay, still learning, bear with me. So I just want everyone, so sometimes when I start with this PSC conversation, I get a lot of like, oh, just one more thing. I know we all have such big plates full of a lot of different things, but I really hope that you come away from this conversation today. We've, like I said, we've had some different conversations about PSC, but I really hope you come away from this conversation um, feeling energized and really feeling like this is something you could incorporate. Um, and, and partner with others on and, you know, something that would be really beneficial to your community. But at the same time, it's not a big, new heavy lift that we're, we're asking you to do in your community. So take a breathe in and breathe out. So does, does anyone know what this is? Has anyone seen this? So this is... This, the spectrum of, of health. So this is something that's used pretty commonly in, in public health areas. So when the reason I am talking to you today about policy systems environmental change is not because I have a, a, a public health degree by, by any means. I'm, I'm pretty a strong community nutrition um, person. That's what my degrees and experience are in. But gosh, eight plus years ago when I, when I took the position as 
as director of the Family Nutrition Program, it happened at the same time that there was large legislation called the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act or Child Nutrition Reauthorization. So it's the reauthorization bill that really um, changed the school meals program. So I'm sure everyone heard about that. Um, some people were happy about it, some weren't happy about it, but it was this major overhaul of, of school meals. Um, one of the changes, one of the things in that, that authorization bill um, that changed our program was it, it cut our funding. So some of you also might remember, we used to have a pretty, footprint for FNP used to be quite a bit bigger. The other thing it changed was that it changed our approaches. So we always had a very strong direct education approach with, with FNP, and we still do. Direct education is still a really important part of, of the work we do and in, in, in our impacts. Um, but it did change and required, we mandated um, through a kind of a slow, gradual um, movement towards more integrated approaches. And so it's kind of that integration of direct education, that skills-based training, which was really our traditional work we did, and these new policy systems and environmental change approaches. So I came in right as this bill was coming in as a new um, coordinator at the end of 2010, and I didn't have any clue, you know, what, it, it took me a lot of, and I'm still learning, um, but it took me a long time to kind of figure out what PSC looks like. So the reason I'm showing this is it, it's, it's a different way of kind of showing the levels of, of what we're trying to reach with, with PSCs and then with some of our other work. So at the bottom is strengthening individual knowledge and skills, which is what the traditional, um, a lot of the traditional work we're doing um, in promoting community education and then now up educating providers. That's a lot of the train the trainer work. So that's, we do a lot of that as well as, you know, again, fostering coalitions and networks. The P, POC, stands for policy. That makes a lot of people nervous because they're like, oh, we're, you know, we can't, you know, we, we can't do policy work or, you know, we're not supposed to be lobbying and, and doing some of that. So I'm not asking you today to, to go out and start doing policy work, but just to understand how policy work is, is a part of PSCs and is a part of kind of that broad level impact. And I'll, I'll share some examples of that. Um, actually, one of the things that we're working on right now up with the Little Mountain Band of Chippewa is looking at walkability and connectivity in their communities. And something that's come up, and it's come up in other, other tribal communities, is a policy that we that wouldn't necessarily be apparent. And that policy is animal control policies. So if you've ever been up in Belcourt or, you know, even down in Fort Yates, I mean, you might notice that there are, you know, more dogs wandering around, and that became a safety issue. So just because you might be changing, you know, changing the environment and making these great scales and forming walking clubs and, and really kind of encouraging those types of things in your communities. If there's policy, if there's not policies in place that, you know, impact the safety of, of walking, it, it's not going to really matter. So policy is really a, a big thing that could, that's impactful for sustainability for some of the, the changes or, you know, the big impact you want to make. And we can think, you know, and that might be a school wellness policy to, you know, some of the bigger policies that was municipal policy to state policy. That's what the P stands for. Doing that. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. Systems. The S stands for systems, and that tends to be the thing that people get the most caught up in. Like, what does this mean? Um, I always just think of it as like a, a, a norm, like a change in norms. Whereas policies are usually written, um, systems changes don't have to be written, and systems changes oftenly often also require, you know, a combination of, of policy and environmental changes. Um, we're not going to get too caught up in, I'll go through the acronym and what each piece is, but the takeaway is there's, there's no right way to do PSDs. You don't have to start with an environmental change and then move on to a policy change to get the systems change. It's not really how it works. It's much more much more unique and, and holistic and, and things just happen organically um, kind of kind of move these along. So like I said, we're not going to get caught up in the acronym, but that's what it stands for. So the systems thing is, is just this broader, um, broader piece. And when we go into, I'm going to talk a little bit about some big public health successes and we'll kind of see that systems piece. 
The environment piece, I think, so easy sounds for environment. I think this might be the easiest thing for us to kind of wrap our heads around because um, it's very physical. I mean, we, we see how our environment shape our health behaviors. And so, you know, the, the next step for us as extension agents is, do we have opportunities to work or help our communities improve those environments, you know, make the healthy choice, the easy choice to, you know, get people closer to those health behaviors that we're teaching about in our classes um, or, or sharing at community events. So kind of the different sectors we think about when we're talking about the different environments. People do a lot of their, you know, spend a lot of their time in day to day. So here's, I, I think with the environment, it's really easy to show some, some really great pictures. Um, the picture in the middle is from Lake Agassiz that's up in Grand Forks. And you can see how, like, what a great, like, you know, it's just a, a beautiful display. So not only do the, does the food look appetizing, they're not just, you know, slapping a, a spoonful of peaches on your, um, on your plate. It's, you know, nice little containers, which, Although more expensive and may contribute to food waste, really have has shown to be an enticement for for kids to grab. It's you know it's easier than um, going through the line. And then the you know look what was grown in our school garden. Um, that's a huge one. That research really bears out that that helps um, kids get more excited about eating fruits and vegetables as if they either participated in in the growing or know who did. Um, the other one. The right of that is, let me see, I'm not sure if Sue is on. Let me get a feel for it. Oh, Linda's on. So, Linda, you probably recognize that Lake Agassiz picture that I used. So, well, that's Linda Custer from Grand Forks who shared that. And then um, that, that buffet table, because does anyone want to pop open their mic and, and share what why that buffet table might be an environmental change? It's from one of Sue Millinder's um, outreach efforts. Or you can type it. Oh, Nicole. Is it like a church that changed the type of foods that they were serving? Yes, or exactly. Or a function? Right. And then there's there's one more one more thing about not just the types of foods. Did they kind of make make it a rule that they would only serve certain types of food? Right. Exactly. So there there is a policy in place, but also in that picture, the healthy stuff is first. So that's something that the order of the, yeah, thanks, Bob, the order of the food matters. I mean, we've found, and that's through, you know, behavioral economics and all these other things. We know people will pile on, you know, if people run out of, of room on their plate for the less healthy things, which there are, I think, some bars way, way, way at the end. But it's just our natural inclination. And again, research has bared it out that that's what people do. So um, that's something from, and you mentioned, you you, you, you picked out, Nicole, with the Communities Alive um, effort, and that incorporates, you know, there's some direct education and outreach. Um, there's there's some policy work. There's some kind of systems change built in there. And then there's these environmental pieces. You know, there's signage, you know, reminding people, you know, about, you know, healthy behaviors. And then, you know, this, this really um, intentional approach to encourage healthy eating during their, um, during their different, you know, celebrations and, um, Fellowship. So the other thing, you know, so I included those stairs because there's a lot of environmental changes we don't even think about. Um, those stairs, you know, I, I was thinking of stepping on. Um, stairs like these are much easier to see because of the way that they're, you know, different different colors. So even something like that can be an environmental change. So if there's stairs that are in an area where, you know, a lot of seniors use and they have the opportunity to make that change, that would be something that they that's an environmental change. Again, I feel like probably the thing that we do the most in when we're working with PSCs, we do you know, kind of start with environmental changes and then it, it branches out because um, those tend to be the ones people recognize the most. So though, that's the acronym, Policy Systems Environments, PSE. Does anyone have any questions or comments, um, things they've done or, or used in their programming? That is, is, is PSC. Hearing none, I will move on. So this is an interactive. I am going to pull up the whiteboard. I'm having fun with all these different things on Skype. Okay. So 
brainstorm what you think the top 10 achievements, according to this, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, top 10 achievements in public health in the, in the past century. So I'm going to pull up the, oh, there, okay, I guess we can do it that way. Thanks. Thanks, Molly. I was going to do the whiteboard, but why don't, why don't we just go ahead and type it into there? We'll do the whiteboard. So Molly, a clean water, vaccine, seatbelts, anyone else? A few people are typing, fluoridated water, good one. Food safety, yes. No, oh, hi, Karen. labeling, yep. Let's see, did we get, I'm surprised, I don't think we saw the biggest one, which is always the one I think about. Oh, 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 oh. Reduction of tobacco use. Um, because I think we, honestly now, I feel like we almost take for granted that smoking is just not, you know, and now I know um, vaping has started to increase in popularity, but when I was in my 20s, I know some of us, when we were in our 20s, and I mean, that's, smoking was, seemed like it was everywhere. And, and now that's been a huge, huge thing that's happened in public health and all the other things mentioned. And I just, I, I bring this up because I think it's important to think about how these things happened um, and all the different factors that went into the success of these public health achievements. Obviously, policies, you know, you think of tobacco use, you know, policies were huge with that. And, you know, when I talk about norms or systems, you know, the system is now set up to, you know, not to be a, a non-smoking system, really. You can't, there's not a lot of places you can you can smoke these days. Um, there is some education. I mean, there is, you know, there is smoking cessation. There is education in, incorporated into youth programming, um, which was very successful and an important component. And then obviously the environmental changes um, was another one. So seatbelts, um, that was one of the ones that was mentioned. Or no, let's go to food safety. So what are what are some, just brainstorm, what would be maybe some some policies, you know, if you can think of any policies or, or systems or environmental things that, that might have contributed to improvements in, in food safety? You can either type or you can open up your mic. FDA regulations, right? You know, you think even the sneeze guards, you know, that's an environmental change that, you know, I don't know if I would go to a, a salad bar if they didn't have a sneeze guard um, and you just take it for granted, but that hasn't always been in place. So what thought you say, well, these are big things. What, you know, what is our role in these? Um, and, and what are our next public health needs um, or, you know, community health needs that, you know, we might be able to, to, to take some, you know, to do some outreach in. And, and really also looking at this, extension helped with a lot of these things. You know, extension, both fresh education and, some, you know, some other partnering. Lines and deaths from heart disease and stroke. Definitely, we had you know input on that. Um, safer and healthier food, healthier mothers and babies. So we, you know, we've been doing this. I'm sure there is probably extension um, materials you can find on fluoridated water. I, you know, I don't know, but but certainly those types of things are are what extensions always you know taken taken a role in. I'm not going to get to this. Is another thing we we show quite a bit is the socio ecological model, and and again the reason we're talking about PSEs is it tends to the more of these circles we can impact, the greater the impact is, and the and the more sustained and you know when we're talking about gold standard of of long term behavior change and population health, it's really trying to um, hit at all these all these different factors. So impact, impact, impact. We talk a lot about impact, public value, um, those types of things in extension. Um, there's a lot of factors in impact. 
And each of the different things we do um, include these factors in, in a different way. Um, for PSCs, you know, they, they hit each, each one of them um, in, in some way, shape, or form. So when we talk about reach, that's like the number of people. Um, it's also, especially for people in, in you know, if, you, if you're like, well, I'm not ever going to have a big reach because I live in a, you know, more, more rural, less populated community, reach can also be a percentage of your audience. So if you're saying, hey, you know, in my community, you know, 60% of the school-aged youth are, you know, in 4-H programming, that's, that's a huge reach. Um, you know, versus using using a number of kids, which compared to you know bigger counties might not might not seem as impactful. Um, frequency is just that dosage piece. You know, it's like how many classes kids go to and and how long those classes are. Frequency is also the what we like to call exposure, um, or or you know, kind of that messaging that dosage. So back to all of those different environments that people are, you know, making health health behavior choices in. If you have a fruit and vegetable message or environmental prompt um, in each of those um, environments, so if someone goes to work and there's you know fruits and you know fruits and vegetables in the break room free, and there's you know messages reminding people you know fruits and vegetables are good snacks, and then they go to the grocery store and there's encouragement in the grocery store to do fruits and vegetables, um, and then you know you go home and you've maybe changed your environment to, you know, encourage eating more fruits and vegetables, um, you, you're getting that message more frequently and you're getting that exposure more frequently. And then effectiveness, that's something, that's our research-based, evidence-based interventions we do. Effectiveness is also about um, pertinence or timeliness. So we can have a great intervention and bring it to some, bring it to a group, but, you know, if you didn't do a needs assessment or if they're not ready for it, um, then it's not going to be particularly effective. Thinking about messaging, so let's say you're driving and you see a, a bus wrap talking about, you know, grab a fruit and vegetable for a snack. I don't know if that's a very effective message at that point in time. Um, maybe if it's about not texting and driving, it, the effectiveness would go up. So another really important factor to consider for impact. And then finally, collaboration. And I'll talk about it a little bit later, but PSE collaboration and coalitions and partnerships are really key for PSEs. So if you're not, if you're not, if you're like, I don't even know where to start with PSEs, the place to start with PSEs is to look at your partnership. Do you have a community coalition? Um, do you have a wellness committee at your school? Because PSEs are not work we do on our own. And I think sometimes, you know, some of our traditional extension work, we, you know, it's we're the, you know, we're the the showrunner. We, you know, we do most of it. Yes, our partners might provide space or help recruit for people, you know, to to show up, but uh, but definitely like that's, you know, to do PSCs, you you need a coalition, and that's not taken away from your efforts. There's no sharing sharing the successes is in no way take away from your efforts. So that's always another important thing to keep in mind that that collective impact is is really important. Molly shared it took years to get back of free parks and to change the concession stands at the park to, to help options. The impact they have over 900 hockey games a year, and at those hockey games, they're getting healthier healthier options. And I know Karen Armstrong's also done some healthy concession work up in um, Rolette County, and it's kind of the same thing. It's it's a slow process, and it's a slow roll, and I think sometimes you really feel like, oh, this is going nowhere, but it is. So I am going to not go through this slide because it's really, you can go back, and so these are just some, some different actual examples. I've heard a lot of people say, I want an example of what this would be. Um, you know, and it kind of takes from the direct education, you know, up through the policy piece. This is the thing anyone who's ever heard me talk about PSE, I always bring this up because I some states when they transitioned to doing more PSE for, for their F and P programming really did away with direct education. And I I think that direct education, that skills based training is necessary. So multi component interventions are really you know the most beneficial. Research has shown that that combination is really impactful. Um, so if you teach a kid to swim, but they don't have a, a pool to swim in and it's not safe and they don't have swim clothes, it's not going to matter. Um, and vice versa, if you build this great pool, I think that's yep, that's in Williston. Um, but no one knows how to swim or, you know, the hours aren't accessible and all these other pieces. 
um, it's it's not going to matter. So we really, I think it's it's you can really read both sides. So when I well, what I've learned from my experience with ESE is really it's a uh, these are all important ingredients. Um, and, and as you know, our group, the specialists and leadership um, is really trying to provide some support with with all these different in all these different areas. I'll, I'll touch. I talked a little bit about um, partnerships and coalitions. It's it's first for a reason because again, I I don't know how you could do PSCs without some strong partnerships and coalitions and and be successful and have it be sustainable. So the directions, as I said, there's there's no there's no right or wrong way to do PSCs. You know, there are, there are toolkits, there's technical assistance, kind of support you along, but each situation is unique. I think you could talk to Molly about about the concession stands and the tobacco free parks and her work on the park over there, and you know she would probably agree and say, yep, you know you can take some of the toolkits are, that are out there and then figure out what's going to work for your community. So did anyone, I hope, I hope people got a chance to at least glance this, this um, article. It, it's pretty recent. It's from the 23rd. Um, a big issue right now in North Dakota. And it's a big issue that actually our legislature and our, the governor's office agree on. So that's kind of amazing. Um, but a, a study came out from the Rural Groceries Initiative. Um, and it, they've been doing a lot of work. And when we have extension partners, hey, Andrea, are you on that? One of our, I think Andrew's on that committee. Or is it Jody? It might be Jody. So anyways, it's a, it's a committee of, of a bunch of different sectors who are working towards this issue. Um, Jody, you believe? Yep, I, I believe it is Jody. So if you, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty insane. And in the last five years, look at how many groceries, we've almost we've lost over 30 grocery stores in our, just in our North Dakota cities with a population of 2,100 or less. Um, so there is a, a resolution that the Senate passed to study it. Um, so that's saying that it's it's important for for um, the legislature. And it, like I said, we've heard a lot from the governor's office, also very you know concerned about that because if you think about the the health and vibrancy of our you know smaller mid sized communities, um, grocery stores are really often the heart of those communities. So a lot of people are concerned about this. And, and we think it's important for extension for us to figure out how can we help? What can we do um, to help the situation in some of our smaller towns? Does anyone have, does anyone live in a town where they they don't have a grocery store or lost their grocery store? It's not looking like anyone does. So, but I mean, it's, it is, you know, I've, I've heard it anecdotally and, and we know that, that it is something that's been coming up. So case study, I'm going to have someone, oh, who wants to, I want someone to read the case study, not me, so you can, you don't get to pick up my voice. Can someone read this? I'm not against calling names, so. I can read it. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. A1 Foods, the grocery store in nice North Dakota, population 2,200, has been struggling for a few years. The costs of products has gone up because the store is not on a main supply route and the owners have struggled, struggled to make a profit. While the owners want to provide items like fresh produce, the cost combined with product, product loss due to perishability and fewer buyers often means there is no profit on those items or even a loss. While community members say they want a local grocery store, they were sad to lose their only cafe a few years ago when the owners retired, more and more they are traveling the 80 miles to the nearest city in another county to shop at a box store. Customers have been less than happy with a variety of products, quality of produce, and all-around look of the store. It appears and acts like a dying store. Nice quality of, let's see, Nice has a new... Sorry, it's the name of the community. I just realized that's goofy. <laughs> nice has a newly formed community coalition made up of a local teacher, a priest. Um, I can't see behind your picture, but I think it says a stay-at-home mom. Oh, I'm moving your picture here. Stay-at-home mom or parent and the mayor. Besides farming, NICE has a processing manufacturing plant um, many nearby. Of the nearby. Many of the workers, some of whom are immigrants, live in a smaller community adjacent to the plant, adjacent to the plant and aren't as connected to the tight-knit NICE community. So thinking about those factors, 
in thinking about your role as an extension agent and some, and maybe some of you have already done work in this realm. Question one to think about, what are the community assets characteristics that can benefit this situation? And you can either type it in or open up your mic and, and share. I can, I'll go back. So community assets, characteristics that are beneficial to this. The coalition, thanks Nicole. A close-knit community, yes. 80 miles, that's a, that's a long, that's not 20 miles, that's a, that's a long way to go. A big employer nearby, good. So these are all really great answers. Um, and definitely all things that can be, be considered when trying to come up with a, a solution that might work for this community before they lose their grocery store. So this is being very proactive in, in you know, what can we do to help um, the situation from, from going down further. What are some community needs in this situation? Kind of on the, on the flip side. Back. Or some of the, you know, the needs or, or the concerns. Oh, yeah, thanks, Karen. Farming background may make it easier to sell the, the buy local concept. Fresh produce is a concern. And from, from a variety, so the customers are concerned that the produce is, doesn't look that great. And then the store is concerned because it's expensive to, to get in produce. And then no one buys it. Or it sits there and then it looks worse and worse. And I, ha I mean, I've talked to actually the... The owner of White Buffalo down in Fort C8s, and he he told me that having fresh produce in his store is a is a zero zero sum game. Like he hopes to not, you know, he thinks it's important, but he, you know, as often as not, might might be losing money on that. Food, food store appearance, certainly the poor facade, right? It's not some it's not a place people want to go to. So they lost their cafe, and their only grocery store is kind of junky. I mean, it's you know, and I'm sure the owners are working hard and doing the best they can. But it's not necessarily a welcoming place, you know, you, you think of wanting to go to unless it's a total necessity. What other people sectors should be, so thinking about this coalition, so who are their coalition members? What, who, who else could be on that coalition? So there's a teacher, a priest, a, you know, stay-at-home parent, the mayor. Um, who are some others that might be employees from the new, nearby plan? Great. Oh, good, Karen. I love that idea. Promote prepared sandwiches for a quick meal as cafe is not available. Rural people, farmers, right? Get a farmer on that. Local growers, yes. There's one specific person on that coalition I'm looking for. Community members, yep, from the adjacent town, yes, because there's other towns around. I mean, if it's 80 miles, there's other towns around. Extension agent, yay, Marie. Extension agent, Andrea, yep, okay, now, yeah, yep, now you're all getting it. Yep, this, the store owner, certainly. I mean, he's, they're every, you know, all people who are invested in the success of the store. It's nice that the mayor is involved because mayors don't always um, see things that, you know, community members might be seeing. Good. And finally, how can how can extension help? And this might not just be with PSCs. I mean, there might be, you know, are there other like how can extension help this this concern, this community um, issue? Facilitate discussion. Good. Shop healthy, stock healthy, and, and shop healthy, stock healthy is a is an intervention. It's a PSC that was developed at the University of Missouri. Some of us have been trained in it. It's quite complex, but it does touch on um, a lot of you know it, it everything from engaging the coalition um, to working with the the store owner to make it look better um, to to really doing what you can to to attract customers. And it's really back to that whole. Um, you know, facilitating discussion between, you know, some of the different, even if people from the um, community or from the um, plants don't necessarily want to be on the coalition, maybe there's other ways you could get some feedback from, from those people. 
um, you know, and, and maybe there's, there's ways you could, you know, you could work with, with that plant to, you know, put up some signs or, or encourage them to, you know, go in and use the stone. Maybe if there's an immigrant, you know, you could work with the store owner. Maybe there's some, you know, specific to their, you know, nationality or ethnicity, you know, some foods that, that might be, um, of interest. I, there's, I think it's up in Grafton, but one of the best Mexican restaurants I've seen that. You know, I think is up in Grafton, and I think part of that is probably due to, um, you know, they have a have a, a population, uh, you know, population of of some some farm workers that are you know from Mexico, and so they have a really good Mexican restaurant up there. Network with other grocery stores, great. Yeah, it's really sometimes our role is just starting as that catalyst, you know, getting more people together, and, and we're really good at that in extension. Um, so we might not necessarily know like exactly the next steps, but the first steps are. You know that needs assessment. Looking at the problem, um, looking at what's what we what's good in the community, looking at you know where there's some gaps and how you know everyone can pitch in. I intentionally start with the assets question because I think sometimes when we think about PSCs, people especially with environmental changes, we get really concerned that we're going to insult our partners or insult our sites or insult our communities you know, by, by coming in and saying, this is something you need, or, wow, your, you know, your school cafeteria is not that great. Like, what can we do? And so it's really important that we come in and, and start with the, start with the positive. Say, like, hey, you know, your, your wellness coalition is doing some great work and, and really trying to, you know, make some improvements. How can I help? Um, so it's not taking a, you know, that negative approach, but really looking at all these, these great things that are already going on um, and that a lot of you are already doing and, and making those connections. Any other comments or questions on this rural grocery issue? So if Extension were to take this on as a statewide effort and then as a, you know, county community effort, what, what do we need? What, what do you need? Like, what are our next steps? I mean, we, we want, we're, we're already at the table. Jody's, Jody's a part of, you know, part of those conversations through her involvement in the Rural Grocery Initiative. Um, I know Lynette's been talking to Lori Kapush, who's, who's in charge of that. Um, you know, I've been talking to our, our Hunger Coalition lead, and, you know, so we've been having these conversations. Lynette's talked to, you know, the governor's office about it. But I think it's, you know, we need to know, you, you all are, you know, the agents are the ones doing a lot of the work so I think it's always important to keep that in mind like you know what do you need to help you know if this is an issue in your community um how can we show that that extension is is at the table so think about that so I'm really oh maybe I'm if this shows then I'm going to be amazed is this showing is my video showing I think it is. It's uh, Cowboy G-R-I-T and kind of it looks like it's showing there. Is it really small? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Rather than make you read, watch a really tiny video, um, as I think we mentioned, we're having some challenges with, with videos in, in Skype. I'm going to send it to you. It is an awesome video about in Cody, Nebraska, they lost their grocery store and together with their school and with a, an entrepreneurial group um, at their school, you know, they have a, a program and it sounds really like a 4-H program, but to build up um, leadership and entrepreneurial skills with kids, with, you know, school-aged middle school and high school kids. And together, they all came together with a lot of other people in the community and, and they have their own community store. And it's run, you know, by volunteers largely, but, but the school, like the kids, work in it, um, you know, so they're lear learning a lot of entrepreneurial skills and money management skills. Um, and, and the whole town has really come around, you know, come come behind the Circle C market and, and people shop there and they do events there. Um, and it's really, you know, reinvigorated the town who, you know, lost their grocery store and now they've done something creative and unique um, to, to fill that fill that gap. So it's a really, it's a, just, really fun video to watch and you know may get some some juices flowing for if you have communities that you know have some some similar struggles so I apologize I will share that as a link um I think it's important to just remember like this, that might not be that was nothing I had ever thought of I think Lynette mentioned hey I think there's a 
a place in Nebraska where there's a grocery store at a school, um, you know, and then I looked it up and yeah, I mean, so it's things like that, thinking outside the box to, you know, come up with these solutions. That's a lot of what PSC is about. You know, it's not the, the package programs. It's not, you know, here's your, here's your curriculum and, you know, go through lessons one through six. It's really working with your, with your community members and thinking up creative solutions and finding where your, your strengths, your own strengths and experiences and um, knowledge can, can contribute. So, and a lot of times it's the communities you're working in, so you're living in. So I think there's that added level of, um, I don't remember why. Oh, I think this is just, again, hammering home, start with partnerships and coalitions. Um, there's a lot of, so I, because of snap Ed, I feel like I've become a clearinghouse for, if there's a toolkit or a needs assessment, um, or, you know, even, I, I, I might have it, you know, for, for a variety of different, um, of, you know, things that might be going on. There's, there's a lot of them out there and a lot of them have passed in front of me. You know, I think really partnerships and coalitions, that's, that's Marie's area and Andrea's area and Jody's area. I mean, we're so fortunate to have the, you know, the leadership and civic engagement um, team as part of our team. So tap into all of that because that's, that's huge. And like I said, I guess these are not going to happen without that ingredient. And this was done a long time ago, but we're all already, you know, this was done, I think, four years ago. And at that time, see, we were still founding consumer sciences. That time, 73% of us were um, on some sort of coalition that benefits our extension work. And, and now, you know, advisory councils are really kind of coming back. And um, I'm not going to do too much with this community engagement because this is, again, more of Marie's um, Area, but just the, you know, there are some some tricky pieces about, you know, building a good coalition, but really, um, you know, the it's longer lasting. It requires less work from you because it's kind of all hands on deck. Um, the change is stronger and more powerful with with investment. Uh, Center for Rural Health um, has an community engagement toolkit. They have a lot of other good data and, and information, and that's it's a UND thing that I really have found some really nice pieces um, in the Center for Rural Health. So go ahead and go and play around in there. So evaluation and reporting is the other thing that I get a lot of questions about. Well, how do we, we how do we show that we're doing PSEs? Like, you know, with direct education, it's really easy. It's surveys. Or, you know, with, with the other programs we do, it's, it's pretty easy. It's, you know, you survey and you say this, this many people went through the program and this is what we're reporting now. Um, PSE is a lot trickier. But luckily with pairs, we have a lot of different places we can report PSEs. Um, you know, you can share these great successes and impact statements, um, success stories, indirect activities. So if you're, that's, you know, that's a lot of times people use those for events or articles. But if you're doing something like going to a food pantry and, you know, encourage, you know, doing food demos, something like that, which would be a, a somewhat of a PSC in that it's, you know, kind of an environmental nudge um, to try to get people to, you know, take some of the dried beans or, or other products that, you know, might be healthier and less um, enticing. And then partnerships and coalitions. That's where I'm seeing a lot of it. And I'm seeing a lot of the PSC work being reported through partnerships and coalitions by FCW agents, not by our by our FNP team, um, who's required to you know re report on on that. But but it's being reported in those partnerships and coalitions. Um, and then again, you know, in, in some of the success stories, those are probably the top three partnerships, coalitions, and success stories. So just so you can look at other people's partnerships and coalitions and success stories and and see what they're doing. Um, another nice thing about I think I'm pretty sure. Can see everyone's, but I'm pretty sure you all can see everyone's too. It's not a, um, there's not really a privacy setting on there. So PSC site activities, that's something that only FNP has right now. However, if we do start to move into doing more PSCs with FCW, um, the the Kansas Pairs team has said that they would do a, a PSC site activities um, module for extension. Um, for our extension, which is not as complicated and involved as as ours is for FNP, but ours for FNP is is targeted or is tailored for um, 
the, the federal stuff we have to report for SNAP Ed. So it's something to consider. So, you know, I mean, it's hard to be asked to do something and then like, well, I don't really have a, a good tool to, to show the work I'm doing. Um, but it's possible, you know, so that's, you know, we might be having some future conversations. I know I have talked to a few people who said they would be interested in having access to like a, you know, PSE site activities because it really does capture, you know, all the different aspects of that. So something to keep in mind. So I want to wrap up with, I, minutes, I hope this is enough time. Um, I hope everyone at least got a chance to just take a peek at that reinventing the traditional senior center in rural areas to attract new and new generation of individuals. I, it's, I just came across my email um, from our department because Art of Brunch is in our department, but, but Jane was really involved in this research. It was done in North Dakota. It was done, right, right, Jane? It was all, I had talked about that, but it was all focus groups done in North Dakota. Yep, it was a, a contract with the Division of Aging Services to conduct this study. And, you know, and it's, it showed some really great information that I think maybe a lot of you might have experienced just by talking to seniors or, um, but I really, I don't know, I just, when I read this, I was like, oh, there's so many opportunities for extension to, you know, and this is what extension is about seeing this research and then figuring out how we can we can take action to improve our communities. I read something, and Jane, you might know more on this, but that North Dakota seniors are the most likely to be living alone. Yes, that's correct. And that we also have pretty high rates. So we also have social isolation issues, which is probably you know somewhat related to that. Is there, is there anything, I don't want to put you on the spot, but is there anything that, you know, as an overview or anything really, you know, from this, from this study that you did that you wanted to share or pull out? I, you know, um, other than, um, you know, the Division of Aging Services really wanted to have this study conducted because they knew they needed to do something with the model of the senior centers that existed today. So um, they are... I, I know meeting with different um, stakeholders across the state um, with this study, the stakeholder report that was produced. And really, it is a community um, effort to change a, a, a senior center and kind of take on a new new role. Um, so I think that's things are in progress in, in North Dakota to make some changes. I do know that this was shared in South Dakota with some nutrition directors and there are two communities in Mitchell, South Dakota, and Rapid City, South Dakota, that have made major changes to their operations. And they've changed the name. They've um, changed their policies. They have younger people coming in. And they've adopted a lot of the recommendations that were included in the report. So that's pretty exciting to see those kind of changes. But it is a process. That's thank you. That's really exciting to hear. And and also that, you know, I, I mean, it's I think that there's definitely opportunities and I'm sure in South Dakota extension was was at the table um, in those communities when they I mean, I guess their their model is a little bit different, but um. yeah, absolutely. So these are the main themes that, you know, so now I hope all of you have either read it or now you've had a chance to kind of go through some of the main themes that came from all these focus groups that that this research team did with with seniors and I think again I think it was about 50 50 so 50 percent of the participants were rural so it was you know really it wasn't the urban areas necessarily that that they're responding but it was also you know had a good mix of, of rural um respondents as well yep there yeah. were eight locations in North Dakota and two were Grand Forks and Bismarck but the others were varying sizes but um, it was a good mix of uh, geographically and urban rural. So these are some of the, there's, there's a lot of really great quotes in this study. And I, you know, I, I can hear my grandmother's, I can hear them in my grandmother's voice. Um, and, you know, one of them, you know, one of the themes was just a negative impression of senior centers. Like, and the quote that I, I'm in denial, I am not going to a senior center, which I think that thread was throughout, like, I'm not old enough to go to a senior center. I mean, you know, my parents went to senior centers. Um, the viability piece also came up, and I suspect probably more in, in the, the rural sites. Um, it comes from not having enough help. 
um, you know, they, they struggle to find the help, the volunteers, and then services go down if, if you don't have the, the, the help and the volunteers. They'd also like to see different offerings. You know, the, the traditional, um, you know, some of the traditional things that senior centers might have offered, you know, they're, they're baby boomers are hip. They want to they wanna do different things. Um, they they wanted technology. They wanted health and health and nutrition and some physical activity pieces um, definitely came up. Um, stepping on would be, you know, I could see stepping on being a great program because that that also kind of came up as something that, you know, they were looking at, at finding out more of. They, you know, they're not just giving up that as baby boomers. They want to learn more and, and learn how to, to do things to prolong their, their good health. And then this another theme um, is is just changing the whole concept of the senior center. I don't want to go to a place where all it is is old people like me. I want to go to a place where there's you know, going to be people of different ages. And so this is kind of this like rolling out, thinking of new, you know, like what um, Jane said, they're just totally redoing those centers um, in, in Rapid City and in South Dakota. And then this whole clubhouse. I want to go to a clubhouse. I don't want to go to a senior center. Um, so just kind of some of these these quotes and these thoughts around um, what's needed and what's wanted. And this is another quote I pulled from from the research study that I, I really think speaks to really any PSC that we're looking at. There appear to be concerns unique to each senior center location that we require grassroots input to find solutions to each center's challenges. You could replace um, senior center and centers with school, with you know, any of the locations where, you know, there's there's some unique situations going on that, that you might be able to offer some assistance. There's no one size fits all with PSCs. So we will wrap up with another case study. I'm going to ask another person to ask to read through the case study. Does someone who hasn't read or, or spoken maybe want to read through this case study? Uh, I can do it, Megan. Oh, thanks. Uh, despite an aging population, the Flat Rock Senior Center in Flat Rock, North Dakota, population 7,500, county seat for Prairie County, has seen a decrease in attendance and participation. Programs are sparsely attended, resulting in fewer volunteers, fewer offerings, and shorter hours. Meal participation has even decreased, as well as attendance at traditionally popular programs like bingo. The Senior Center has a kitchen cafeteria, offices, a classroom, an open space, Space currently being used as temporary storage and a small outdoor park area. The Senior Center is centrally located by some shops, a place of worship, a park, a head start site, and an elementary school, but not well connected by sidewalks. A recent study in North Dakota highlighted issues of social isolation among seniors, as well as higher rates of obesity than the national average. The Senior Center Director, as well as the Extension Advisory Council, see increasing engagement with the community seniors as a need in the community. Thank you, Bob. That's, that's a lot to take in. That's a lot of information about the Senior Center. So what are the community assets characteristics that can benefit the situation? And on the flip side, what are some of the challenges? Type it in or open up the mic. Walkability is a challenge, yes. Try adding the kids in, involving the youth. But you're right. There, there are some some opportunities because there's a Head Start site and an elementary school site close by. So that's an, that's definitely an asset and an opportunity. I know. Center, around, I know around here they usually have um, the grandparents read to the kids. Right. So they have their, they have an adopted grandparent program. Some of them Good. try that. So. Good. Thank you, Reba. The, so Maria Center is centrally located. There's there's outdoor space. So what could we do with the outdoor space? Just think, our oh, gardening, right? Outdoor space for gardening. Ra put you know some raised beds that are accessible. There's lots of opportunities. There, right, Dina? You know, there's a kitchen and a cafeteria. Senior cooking classes. Right, senior cooking classes could be a good or classes offered outside, right, Nicole? I mean, so they. Well, I think one of you know we've we've 
the the location is is great. Um, they do have some some assets in the building and, and outside the building, so the location is great. So that said, okay. Oh, what other people sectors could be engaged in a solution? So so far, it's the senior center director and and your advisory council of um, I forgot what the what I called the county. Perry County, the advisory council. The Extension Advisory Council of Prairie County is, is really interested in, in making the senior center more viable. But, but what other people sectors could be engaged in the solution? Local gym instructors, good. Business owners, yes. Now, Maria, what would business owners have to contribute? Not to put you on the spot. Well, I think there are opportunities, you know, they might um, bring like a something that they have. Let's say it's a clothing store. They want to bring out some, have a, a way to show new fashion. Uh, maybe it's a restaurant and the restaurant wants to have kind of a, a way to showcase some of their things that they're doing. Or they could have where the cooking class, the restaurant chef comes to them. So I think business owners, they have a, it's a win-win. They get their name out, but also there's something that can bring in the community, in particular, maybe the seniors. Great, I love that. Thank you. So Jane also included educators and faith communities, yes. So now Nicole's already moved on to the what pod. So <laughs> great. Good job, Nicole, reading ahead. So what so now we're thinking about PSE. This is so you know, I think we one of the things that came from the study is that they want different they want different types of educational offerings. And and honestly, we, we got that. We we already have some really great educational offerings that you know we can bring to these new invigorated um, you know, clubhouses or or whatever they might call them. Um, but what what other either environmental changes or which is what you know Nicole said she, improve the sidewalks. So even if there you know even if there is a, a school nearby, um, you know if the sidewalks aren't great, it's a little harder to or you know the head start. You know if there's it's easier to get to and from rather than having to you know get everyone piled into a vehicle and, and drive between sites. If it's easier to walk or or you know have a, a healthier way of transportation, sidewalks improved sidewalks would help. A ton. That would also probably involve policy change, um, or some some type of you know that's a always a big change, but it, it's amazing how much those walkability improvements really do benefit. Right. Learn learn from the residents what the programming activities they would like to see at the center. That's a, that's a good start, and you know kind of that other people um, that coalition piece might be able to. What environmental changes might might improve the situation? What other environmental changes? We are. We mentioned, you know, bringing the kids in. I, I, you know, I love that you mentioned that. I don't know if you read the article, but that, or if you had the chance to read the study, but that came up. I mean, that was a, a big deal. They wanted. They didn't want to feel like it was just a place that seniors spend. Um, so we do a lot of programming with kids too. It might be a natural connector between those two. And then, you know, I, I just always think right away of gardens and all the horticultural stuff we do um, with kids and and with seniors. Um, that there could be a really nice opportunity to put in some raised beds, and you know the, the Head Start kids come over, the you know school kids come over, and 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 work with you know work with the participants in that situation. Bring different food trucks, and I love that because I think sometimes we get caught up in you know seniors don't want the cool and hip things, or baby boomers don't want the cool and hip things, but that's not even true. They they totally do. Um, yes, thanks, Jane. Um, that was one of the big big things from this is don't call it a senior center. Call it a community center. Um, you know, if if this this senior center has this big space, you know, maybe they could do a little fitness area, and and maybe it could be open to to other people in the community, or they could do you know different types of things in there. So if you on the final page or page 15 of this, they actually have recommendations and suggested strategies to attach to attract baby boomers to senior centers. So if if you this is work that you might think about doing in your community. I, yeah, Social and Activity Club, I love that, Molly. Um, read this and it's all these different bullet points of things and, and really definite places where, you know, extension could, could provide some support. So I'm just gonna finish with this. There's like a minute for questions, but really, you know, the, the whole point of PSC is it's not a, it's, it's what you make it. Um, it's what your communities make it. 
there is evidence and in, in research supporting certain um, you know outreach activities and interventions to drive those impact and behavior changes, but it really is unique to the communities we're working in. And many hands make light work. This is not something we want anyone extension agent to take on on their own. It really is imperative that you engage your partners, um, your community coalitions. Questions, comments, I hope this was a lot. You know, whenever we talk about PSC, it's we never quite know where to focus. Um, we are hoping to have, you know, again, ongoing conversations. Um, we might set up regular calls if people want to kind of talk through some of these things. There are a lot of extension agents, a lot of SDW agents doing PSCs and that are not just our um, F&P agents. So even just getting groups together to kind of talk through what's working, what's not working, I think might could be beneficial because it's, 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 it's the direction um, that we're moving in. And, you know, it's important that, you know, we feel more comfortable with, with the ideas um, and more comfortable with just this, this kind of new approach that, you know, we might be taking through some of our extension activities. And I would uh, say if there are some questions, Megan, that they, they could maybe reach out to you. Uh, oh, here is a question yeah. from Bob. Thanks, Bob. Yes, I think I think a community of practice would be great. Um, and I'd be happy to, to work with you on setting that up or, or, or being a part of that. Well, as we're finishing up here, Megan, I want to thank you very much for helping extend our knowledge, because that's what you've been helping us do with our discussion, with the information, with your ideas, your experience. So we really appreciate you doing that and for everyone to be on today um, for them their participation and their ideas as well. So thank you so much. Thanks, Marie. Thanks, everyone. And I'll uh, look for this in two weeks. We'll have our last webinar with um, Jody talking about the entrepreneurship. And uh, this particular webinar will be up on the Ag Info site uh, soon. And then, Megan, if you can send me your PowerPoint, I'll put that up there as well. Perfect. All right. Thanks, everyone.